Welcome back to the second installation of I Listen To So You Don't Have To, everyone's favorite Mike the Snare ripoff. For those who don't know, I started this series as a way to try to broaden my dumb white boy hip hop head sense of music, and so every once in a while I'll list a couple artists on Twitter and throw up a poll, and whichever artist wins, I'll dive into their discographies and give my opinions here. And for this episode, the public chose Aphex Twin, which is a blessing because I've loved the stuff of his that I've heard, but it's also a curse because he has a ton of music and it's spread over a bunch of different names. So to make this easier on myself, as well as preventing this video from becoming well over an hour, uh, I'm only going to stick to projects put out underneath the Aphex Twin name, and out of those projects I'm only going to stick to studio albums as well as a couple of handpicked EPs that I felt are important to talk about. This includes, in order of release, Didgeridoo, Xylem Tube, Selected Ambient Works 85 to 92, Selected Ambient Works Volume 2, I Care Because You Do, Richard D. James, Come to Daddy, Window Licker, Drux, Syro, Computer Controlled Acoustic Instruments Part 2, Cheetah, and Collapse. So for those of you who are wondering why it took so long for this video to be made between the time I announced it and the time it's coming out now, Fuck you. For the people who don't know who I'm talking about, Richard D. James, aka Aphex Twin, is an IDM slash techno slash ambient artist based in England. He is known for his incredibly influential catalog of groundbreaking music that has changed not just electronic music, but music as a whole, inspiring some of my favorite musical projects of all time. Richard began his musical journey underneath the name AFX in the year 1991, creating acid techno music that was inspired by the techno scene that was happening in Europe at the time. However, as I mentioned before, this video was only going to cover the music put out underneath the name he would create in 1992, Aphex Twin. So, without further ado, let's dive headfirst into the world of Richard D. James and his Aphex Twin. The first two projects ever put out underneath the Aphex Twin name are both four-track EPs that are centered around the acid techno genre. And for those of you who are as bad with genres as I am, RateYourMusic.com describes acid techno as, quote, evolving out of the acid house scene and arguably from German trance in addition. Acid techno combines the elements, excuse me, provided from the aforementioned relatives into the frame of regular techno, tending to be calmer and using a series of roll-in instruments like the TB303 and other synthesizers to utilize its layers. This includes unconventional adjustments among these instruments to achieve its famous, quote, acid sound. Hmm, interesting. Uh, what the fuck does that mean? When I first listened to these two EPs, I thought that acid techno was repetitive house music that used synthesizers and that focused more on the texturing and layering of the songs than the actual progression of the music. But after reaching out to a friend that's really good with genres and growing my knowledge on the music, I found out that this is an Aphex Twin exclusive trait. So my answer is, I have no fucking clue what acid techno is, but the way that Aphex Twin makes acid techno I don't like. So when I talk about these two EPs, I want you to keep that in mind. Didgeridoo is the first of the two EPs to be released in 1991, and it's my least favorite of the bunch. The EP is split into four different tracks, and each song is so goddamn repetitive that it was genuinely a struggle to get through this project. It was so repetitive, in fact, that the highlight of the EP was a five second break in which a girl talks for a couple of seconds on the track Isoproflex aka Isopropanol. But then after that, it switches right back, and I just... I don't, I don't like it. I don't like it. That was it. That was the highlight of this project for me. The second EP to be released in 1991 is titled Xylem Tube, and it features a very similar vibe to that of Didgeridoo, except it is a little bit less repetitive. But that in no way means that it's gone at all. And look, I get it, Aphex Twin's music is very largely based around repetitiveness, but I think that what makes his music great, and even in his next album, is that he finds a way to blend that repetitiveness with other genres and other sounds that keeps his music interesting. And the very first step that he took in that direction just happens to to be one of the most infamous and influential electronic albums of all time. Just one year after the release of his first two EPs, Aphex Twin put out his debut album, Selected Ambient Works 85 to 92. And as I mentioned in the last chapter, it mixes his techno sound with ambient music, as well as a new genre that Aphex was helping to pioneer called IDM. IDM 
Very, unfortunately, stands for Intelligent Dance Music, which is literally the worst genre name I've ever heard, ever. The best way I can describe IDM is dance music that you can't dance to, which might make one think, why is it called IDM music? And the answer is I have literally no clue. But enough about bad genre titles, let's talk about the project itself. Selected Ambient Works 85-92 to is one of those albums that just comes out once in a blue moon. It completely changed electronic music forever, and it also inspired so many artists, electronic and not, to change their sound. Nirvana, including Dave Grohl, Radiohead, including Tom York, Kanye West, Travis Scott, Nine Inch Nails, Steve Reich, Tool, Frank Ocean, Bjork, Daft Punk, Death Grips, Red Hot Chili Peppers, Linkin Park, Flying Lotus, Doja Cat, Dead Mouse, Arca, Slow Tie, Pharrell Williams, and Skrillex, just to name a few. But influential doesn't always mean good. Unless you're Aphex Twin, of course. The first three tracks on this album are 10 out of 10 perfect. Crystal is such a great album opener, and it perfectly encapsulates everything that makes this project great. The second track, Da, is a masterclass in ambient techno music, and somehow it finds a way to keep my attention span despite the above average length. And of course, the third track, Pulse With, a fun and upbeat track that really lightens the mood of the first half of the album. If I had to recommend three tracks to someone to get them into Aphex Twin, it would be these first three tracks tracks off of this album. They perfectly showcase his early talent, and they're mainstream enough for any average listener to quote-unquote get it. But after those first three tracks, there's still a hell of a lot of album left. And for the most part, it's, it's pretty good. I don't think that any of the rest of the tracks in the album carry the same charm to me for some reason than those first three songs, but genuinely, I still think the rest of the album is pretty good. But I do have one hot take that has to do with this album, and that is that one of the most popular songs off of the entire project, Age, Aegis, Aegisopolis, Aegispolis, Aegis, Age, Aegis, Aegispolis. Uh, it's one of my least favorite songs on the album. I, I'm not a big fan. Maybe it just hasn't clicked yet for me for some reason, but I just can't really get behind the overly glitchy and 8-bit production on this song. But with that being said, I like this album a lot, and I can see very easily how so many artists latch onto it. And it's crazy to think that some of these tracks were made when Richard was only 14, which is just mind-boggling considering how forward-thinking the album truly is. But the best part, in my opinion, is that this album comes with a sequel. Ah. Yeah. The only thing better than a two and a half hour ambient project is a two and a half hour ambient project that has no song titles. Selected Ambient Works Volume 2 is, in my opinion, the first real sign of growth in Aphex's music. This release signifies a separation from the techno genre and a full-on embrace of the ambient genre. For the viewers of mine who don't know what ambient music is, uh, you're a fucking liar because everyone and their mother has heard the Minecraft soundtrack at one point or another. But if that definition doesn't do it for you... RateYourMusic.com defines ambient music as, quote, music that puts more emphasis on actual sound than musical structure, aimed at forming a particular atmosphere or mood with the help of conventional and unconventional instruments, sound clips, and sometimes vocal clips. And Aphex Twin does that to his full extent. Track 3 is one of the most beautiful pieces of ambient music that I've ever heard, creating a rich and painful tone to the album. Tracks 4 and 5 even dabble in dark ambience and drone music, mixing the distant sounds of tribal music with dirty and perverted sounding synths. And throughout the entire album, Aphex Twin creates what I can only describe as massive. Everything about the music feels like this enormous presence that just won't leave no matter what you do. This project totally caught me off guard because I was expecting a sequel to the almost entirely upbeat sounding selected Ambient Works 85-92 but I'm really happy with this tone change. And even on the songs when he happens to fall back on ambient techno, he does it in a way that sounds fresh and new. In fact, I might even go as far as to say, as Selected Ambient Works Volume 2 surpasses its predecessor. I think the music holds up a lot better to modern standards, even though it's not as groundbreaking technically. Which, by the way, Pitchfork still called this project the album that changed ambient music forever. But then again, take everything Pitchfork says with a grain of salt. Fuck that website. And with that being said, it's time to move on to our next Aphex Twin album, but uh, remember when I said that I like this new, like, ambient thing that he was doing? Yeah, um, we're just not gonna do that ever again. He's just not gonna, we're just gonna stop doing that all over, all, all together, really. So, 
I hope you liked it while it lasted, because he's just not going to do that again. One year after selected Ambient Works Volume 2, Aphex Twin was finally back with his third studio album, I Care Because You Do. And for the most part, it's it's pretty hit or miss for me with this project. This album has some amazing tracks on it with songs like Alberto Balsam or The Wax and Piss. But for every great song on this project, there's an equally mid song that does nothing for me. The album is inconsistent throughout, both in quality and theme, and it even features one of my least favorite Aphex Twin songs of all time, Ventolin. But overall, this record is still enjoyable to some degree. The previously mentioned Alberto Balsam is one of the most relaxed and accessible Aphex Twin songs, but it's refreshing after having to sit through shit like this. <laughs> However, after listening to the song that comes after I Care Because You Do, I can see that this project is more of a transitional period for Aphex Twin. Aphex Twin's next album, Richard D. James, would soon follow I Care Because You Do, and genuinely, I thought this was going to be my favorite project of his. Genuinely, I did. Until track 7. What the fuck happened? Tracks 1 through 6 are so weird in the most perfect way possible, and then track 7 comes along, Goon Goombas, and it's like the polar opposite of that. The first six tracks rely so heavily on crazy drum patterns, and then track seven comes along and it's like they just forgot to put the drums in. It sounds like some shit that I would hear while I'm running around Minecraft. For example, here is track two off of the album. And this is what Goon Goompa sounds like. But the worst part is that the next three songs just keep going like nothing happened. Like they just forgot, like an interlude that was just copy and pasted from a C418 album. It does not make any sense. Why does this song exist? Why? Why does it exist in the place that it is? Why is it, is what I'm trying to ask. Why? I was genuinely contemplating giving this album a high 9. I, I, I loved it, and while Goon Goompas doesn't take away from the other tracks, it literally halts the project for a solid 2 minutes and then just lets you keep going. And it's stupid fucking dumbass song took my score down a whole number a whole number why did why did you do that with that out of the way the rest of this album really does feel like poetry in electronic form the opening track four is one of my favorite if not my favorite Aphex twin song of all time the, the little samples from like in the studio that he puts in right before the drop is so satisfying and it adds so much character to the song i love it the track girl slash boy is what goon goombas should have sounded like it takes the childish sounds of goon goombas and mixes it with the intense drum patterns of the rest of the album and and it meshes it together, creating a perfect track. And the album is a modest 35 minutes, which is so relieving after the behemoth that was the two and a half hour selected Ambient Works Volume 2. And lucky for me, the next two EPs would be just as short and would soon become two of my favorite Aphex Twin projects of all time. Stop making that big face! Look, this this video is going to be long, okay? There's no getting past that. I know that, and you know it because you clicked on it. And I, I really, I don't want you guys getting tired of the sound of my voice, so I brought in uh, Mickey T from the Tape Podcast, everyone's favorite Irish reviewer. So, uh, M Mickey, do what you do, whatever uh, that means. Just do it. Do what you do. Whatever you say, Jackson, I'll add to this godforsaken video. After the attention that Aphex Twin received from Richard D. James' album, he followed it up with a single and an EP of the same name. That EP was entitled come to daddy, and it would go on to be another landmark moment in the Aphex Twin catalog. If you thought the album covers for a Richard D. James album and I Care Because You Do were creepy enough already, then take a look at Come to Daddy and tell me this isn't the most creepy thing known to man. I mean, that's an exaggeration, but either way, this cover is something else. Also, I forgot, the music video for Come to Daddy, the Pappy Mix, is one of the most iconic and terrifying music videos of all time. It was directed by Chris Cunningham, and the visuals worked into the video truly make this a terrifying experience. I won't blabber on any longer, if you haven't seen the video yourself, then I'd recommend watching it. But for now, let's just talk about the music on Come to Daddy. Come to Daddy essentially saw Aphex Twin try and branch out into a more drum and bass tinged approach to his IDM sound while also embracing this creepy and weird aesthetic. 
The cover of the EP was already indicative of that, but a lot of the tones and vocal samples worked into the songs are strange to say the least. Take the Come to Daddy Little Faltroy mix and Funny Little Man, the former of which matches the eerie and alien feel of the song, and the latter... I have no fucking idea what Richard was thinking, but it's strange, alright? The EP itself even opens with a track that is just setting a terrifying tone, and that's the Come to Daddy Pappy mix. Richard is quoted to saying this about the track. Come to Daddy came about while I was hanging around in my house, getting pissed and doing this crappy death metal jingle. Then it got marketed and a video was made, and this little idea that I had, which was a joke, turned into something huge. It wasn't right at all. It's even been said that he removed the record from circulation for one week, hoping to prevent it from reaching number one, and it ended up peaking at 36. Well, good on you, Richard. You made a distorted, terrifying, piss-take song, and it's a fucking banger. How do you even follow up such a banger, though? Well, you follow up with one of the most dreamlike IDM songs ever, and that's the iconic Flim. It's this incredibly soothing moment after such an abrasive song. Its bright melodies and soothing atmospheres make the track all the more transcendental. It's an accessible track that the average listener who doesn't even know Aphex Twin might know, and it's a masterpiece of electronic music, in my opinion. A similar moment that I'd like to point out is Is Us, which is another masterclass in sweet ambience and IDM. The percussion is a lot more metallic and it's such a vibe through and through. Another highlight for me is the intense Bukephalus bouncing ball, I don't know how to fuck to say that, which is such a thudding, hectic and intense track that just soaks you into its weirdness and I definitely recommend. Overall, Come To Daddy is a pretty fucking weird EP that has some of Aphex Twin's oddest but also most rewarding moments. It stands out as an essential EP in the grander scheme of electronic music and if you haven't already listened to this, please just do yourself a favour and experience this EP at your own risk of course. Now, my time is up. Uh, back to whatever the hell you were doing, Jackson. Thank you for that, Mickey. Uh, I, I really hope you didn't just do gay jokes for five minutes. Uh, I don't watch my videos before I post them. So I really uh, hope that's not what you did. Anyways, after Come to Daddy, Aphex Twin would soon release one of its biggest hits to date, alongside with one of my favorite music videos of all time. Window Liquor is the shortest project we've talked about so far, as it only includes three tracks. The sounds seen on each track are very much reminiscent of the Come to Daddy EP, featuring grimy synthetic sounds that seem completely inhuman, accompanied by strange and uncomfortable vocals. Each track is so different from the song that comes before it, but yet they all feel connected, almost as though they're banded together through the weirdness of the sounds. These two EPs, as I mentioned before, are some of my favorite projects that Aphex Twin has ever put out, but they're also some of my favorite EPs in general. But it was at this point in his discography that I came to the realization that Aphex Twin will never have a 10 out of 10 project in my eyes. But I'll elaborate more on that later. Because now, it's time for the next full-length LP in the Aphex Twin discography. Hopefully, it's as short and sweet as the last three projects were, I said hopefully. Aphex Twin's fifth studio album comes in at a whopping hour and 40 minutes and is easily the most bipolar project I have ever heard in my entire life. Each track on this record, individually, is pretty good by itself. There aren't really any horrible songs on here, bar a miss here or there. But my big issue comes with this album as a whole. Half of Drux sees Aphex Twin taking a new direction, throwing out his glitchy and fast-paced drum phase, and replacing it with beautiful piano melodies, one of which was sampled uh, sorry, I mean stolen, stolen by uh, Kanye West on his song Blame Game. I did not forget about that, by the way. I s don't do that, please. But as I was saying, the other half of this album is totally different. And as I said in a previous chapter, the best way of showing you is just by letting you listen to the songs. This is what track 15, Kesson Dalek, sounds like. And this is what the following track sounds like. And that is what the entire album is like. A back and forth fight between soft piano and ambient music and fast paced drums and IDM. And in my opinion, this is just not how his music should be enjoyed. If I want to hear ambient Aphex Twin, I'm going to listen to Selected Ambient Works Volume 2. If I want to hear IDM Aphex Twin, I'm going to listen to Richard D. James or Come to Daddy. And clearly, mixing those two only ends in a mess. And obviously, I have no clue if what I'm about to say is true, but 
Maybe this inability to land on one sound is the reason why the following events are going to happen. Because after Drux, no major releases will be put out underneath the Aphex Twin name for another 13 years. Cyro is the antithesis of what Drux is. Instead of being all over the place sonically and having great standalone tracks, I feel like Cyro works best as a holistic album, but its individual tracks lack charm. And, and for the most part, I, I enjoyed Cyro. Is it nearly as groundbreaking and lovable as some of his other studio albums? No, but I, I think this is a pretty safe release for Aphex One to put out after such a long break. But once again, by no means is this thing bad or boring, it's just not what I would expect an Aphex Twin release to be. The one part of this project that I would like to take a little more time on though, is the final track. This closer is the most gorgeous electronic song I've ever heard, period. And it, it works, but only for a couple of reasons. The first being that it contrasts the rest of the album, but in a way that makes sense. Instead of pulling me back and forth between two different sounds, I feel as though Aphex Twin has made the point he's trying to make, and now that that's finished, he can finally create this beautiful piano piece. The chords that he uses melds together to create this perfect closure feeling that I think that most of his records have honestly missed. And with the final few notes on the last track, the listener finishes the last song of the most recent Aphex Twin full-length LP. But this is not where the video ends, because we still have three more EPs to talk about. <sighs> I am so tired. When I first scrolled through a list of all of the Aphex Twin projects on the website albumoftheyear.com, this one scared me the most, and that's because out of all of the albums and EPs that we'll tackle today, this one has the lowest average user rating. And so, I nervously put my earbuds in, and after 27 minutes, I don't know why this is rated so low. This is just this is just a pretty damn good EP, if you ask me. I don't I don't really have any complaints. Computer Controlled Acoustic Instruments Part 2 is exactly what it sounds like. It's Aphex Twin trying to trick your ears into thinking they're hearing real acoustic instruments, when in fact they're of course not. And he does it really well, like genuinely this EP doesn't seem like it's humanly possible. And look, maybe I'm being naive because this is my first time hearing something out of this genre, but I, I think this is pretty damn good. Another thing that I really like about this project is that it doesn't really sound similar to anything that Aphex Twin has done. I've seen in a lot of reviews that people compare this EP to drugs, and honestly I can kind of see it, but really this does feel like its own thing. I also think that as opposed to drugs, the choppiness of the tracks works here. It's almost like the lack of flow on the EP is just to remind the listener that hey, this isn't just some goofy piano and drum piece that I made in my basement, this is me tricking you into thinking you're listening to real instruments. And so, to make a long story short, this EP is heavily underrated, and I would recommend this to all the listeners watching this, even if you're a fan of Aphex Twin and you don't like it, I would highly suggest re-listening with a new ear. There was no watch there. I don't know why I did that. We have we have two more EPs left. I'm I'm running out of transition ideas. I'm going to be honest, guys. This video is unfortunately going to end exactly where it started, with two pretty boring and repetitive EPs. These last two projects are easily the most disappointing, the most unnecessary, and the most uninspired pieces of music I've talked about in this entire video. The first of the two, Cheetah, is easily the worst of the duo. With only a 33 minute long runtime, I found myself constantly checking to see when it was over because it felt so goddamn long. And the next EP, Collapse, was almost as bad. It just felt like b-sides from his older projects that just got scrapped, and for a good reason. And honestly, it, it just hurts to see that this is where it ends. Aphex Twin is rightfully credited as being one of the most forward-thinking electronic artists of all time. His projects have inspired some of the most talented musicians that this world has ever seen. And so when I turn on a new Aphex Twin album, or a new Aphex Twin EP, my expectations are set very high because of that. And for the most part, throughout this whole video, my expectations were either met or raised. But honestly, with these last two EPs, it feels like Richard has just thrown in the towel. And even with those great projects underneath his belt, remember all the way back to the Window Licker chapter when I said that it was impossible for me to give an Aphex Twin album a 10 out of 10? Well, that's because of a major musical trait that Aphex Twin nearly ignores throughout his entire discography.
I fucking love albums that flow. There is nothing more satisfying to me than listening to a project where every track and every transition feels like it belongs. And my enjoyment of an album is heavily reliant on those factors being present. And Aphex Twin just never does this except for a few times on track to track transitions. Almost every album feels more like a compilation piece than it does a holistic work, and because of that, I'm disappointed because there's albums like Richard D. James or EPs like Come to Daddy where every track is good, and then you have one song like Goon Goompas, or you have no transitions in between the tracks. And these problems are, are so fixable, I can see he has the talent. I can see it. I just need to see him put together a work where ever, all the pieces fit together. That's what I just want. I want an Aphex Twin album where all the pieces fit together. On my last edition of I Listen So You Don't Have To, I talked about the group Swans, and I had a little segment at the end where I talked about things that I want to see from Swans in the future, and I feel like the things that I want from Swans are very similar to what I want from Aphex Twin. Aphex Twin strives in pushing boundaries. I mean, at this point, he's pretty much made a career out of it. His best work comes from stuff that's so glitchy and so weird that it just, it just works. And his more recent attempts at making music have seemed more uninspired and accessible. And like I said earlier, there's nothing wrong with making accessible music, it's just that I think that Aphex is at his best when he's making things that make you uncomfortable. But now, it's really just up to what Richard wants to do. Let's just hope that what Richard wants to do is make good music. Anyways, that's gonna do it for today's video, guys. Uh, if you haven't checked out Aphex Twins music, I highly, highly recommend you do. It, it really is crazy watching a 14 year old kid changed the way that people make music forever, so definitely go do that. If there's a specific artist that you want me to cover in the future, uh, drop a comment and tell me because I, I really don't know what I'm doing right now. Uh, and if you want to vote on the poll for the next one, make sure you follow me on Twitter so you get the alert. If you super super enjoy the video, uh, I have a Patreon where you can pay money to see more of me, which is uh, a pretty sweet deal if you ask me. So, But with that being said, thanks for watching and I'll catch you guys next time.